Imagine it's December 1900 in Westchester, New York. You're just finishing off a round of 18 holes of golf with your boss, Andrew Carnegie, and now you're sitting down for dinner at his cottage near the course. You are the president of the Carnegie Steel Company, but you have a much bigger vision in store. You're hoping to engineer a merger of the nation's largest steel firms, and you've brought in top banker J.P. Morgan to lead the venture. But first, you have to do the unimaginable. You have to convince your boss to sell his steel empire to Morgan. Carnegie chuckles as he takes a sip of brandy. I have to say, Charles, not your best game today. You feign a sheepish grin. Guess I'm out of practice. Too much time behind a desk, but clearly your swing has never been better. That's because I have natural talent. I'd say you've been spending more time on the course lately. Why not go all the way? I hear Louise is ready for you to retire. Uh, she told you too, huh? Yes, she's been nagging me for years to spend more time at home. Carnegie then narrows his gaze. But why do you ask? You brace yourself. This is a delicate matter, but there's no way around it. Well, what would you say if I told you that Morgan wants to buy you out? Ah, there it is. Now I see why you played so poorly today. You're just trying to butter me up. Louise may have hinted that winning a round of golf tends to make you more cooperative, so... Yes. Anyways, what do you say? What do I say? I say that I don't submit to anyone, and certainly not J.P. Morgan. That's not the way I do business. You follow Carnegie as he gets up to take a seat beside the fire. Yeah, but what else is left? You've achieved new heights of production, maximized efficiency, squeezed every last dollar out of your workers. Surely business can only go downhill from here. The European steelmakers are growing, and you never know when the next depression will hit. Carnegie looks unconvinced, so you try a new tack. And then finally, you be free to pursue your other passions. Don't think I didn't read your book. I think more people should have read it. I'm glad you did, though. Yes. I would like more time for my charitable endeavors. Precisely. And if you sell, just think what you could do with the extra money. That's a new century. Leave the day-to-day grind to the rest of us. Hmm. There is so much more to do. To advance knowledge, boost scientific research. You know, I consider it my duty to devote my wealth and talents to promoting the greater progress of society. Yes, all the more reason. Name your price. I'll take it to Morgan. Carnegie reaches into his pocket and pulls out a scrap of paper and a blunt pencil stub. All right. I'll agree to sell if Morgan can meet this number. He hands you the slip of paper. Your eyes go wide as you read the figure he scrawled. $480 million. And mind you, I want payment in gold-backed bonds, not watered stock. Noted. I'll take this to Morgan myself tomorrow. You tuck the paper into your pocket and stare off into the fire, your head swimming with visions of your future, reigning atop the American steel industry. If Morgan agrees to Carnegie's terms, he'll form the largest corporation in the world. And if all goes to plan, place you in charge. From Wondery, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American History Tellers. Our history, your story. In 1900, Charles Schwab, the president of Carnegie Steel, invited his boss, the famous steel magnate Andrew Carnegie, to play 18 holes at St. Andrew's Golf Course in New York. After a relaxed afternoon and a quiet dinner in Carnegie's cottage, Schwab finally broached the real reason for his visit to persuade Carnegie to sell his company to J.P. Morgan, Wall Street's most powerful banker. Schwab succeeded by convincing Carnegie that selling would leave him more time to pursue his charitable endeavors, and Carnegie agreed. The sale merged Carnegie's empire with nine other companies to form the United States Steel Corporation, creating the world's first billion-dollar enterprise. The deal made Carnegie the richest man on earth, and after selling his company, he did devote himself fully to philanthropy. Carnegie knew that his unimaginable wealth was built on the back of working people, and he sought to justify his fortune by giving it away to fund libraries and universities. He believed that extreme inequality was a necessary price to pay for the greater progress of society as a whole. But for the average worker, the creation of U.S. steel and the corporate giants like it was nothing more than disturbing evidence of capitalism run amok the culmination of the greed and exploitation that defined the Gilded Age. 
Today, we talk with Tim Wu, a Columbia law professor and author of The Curse of Bigness, Antitrust in the New Gilded Age. We talk about the economic and social changes that took place then, how they set the stage for modern America, and where big business stands today. Here's our conversation. So, Tim Wu, thank you for speaking with me today. Thank you for having me. So, the Gilded Age was a period of huge economic and social transformation in the United States. Your book, The Curse of Bigness, Antitrust, and the New Gilded Age, indicates that we might be revisiting that era of change. But then, in the first Gilded Age, America was clearly more homogenous with less economic disparity and a lack of scale in corporate America. What changed during the the original Gilded Age and what impact did it have on American social structure? Yeah, so one of the most important transformations of that era was the invention of big business, the arrival of big business, the creation of the first industry spawning monopolies. These were something truly new to the American landscape. There was a period in which anything of any size, frankly, uh, in most of the world, uh, was governmental. Genghis Khan's army, the Great Wall of China, the British government and its fleet. These, these were military or government projects. The idea of private industry, private enterprise, having national scale things, uh, uh, industry-wide monopolies, this was new to the Gilded Age. So this newness, how did it change American culture? Well, uh, maybe we should be careful about what we're talking about here. So there had always been business in America, um, obviously, uh, and there'd always been uh, farmers, agriculture. There'd even been, you know, larger businesses. But the idea of a national business, that, that uh, was something new. The idea of a monopoly, the only seller of a product, uh, uh, that was completely new. Um, the first of these monopolies was the Western Union Telegraph Company. And I think it's telling that it, it played a role that had uh, traditionally been paid, played by the federal government. Uh, the, the post office delivered mail. Telegraph a company delivered, uh, you know, messages uh, electronically. Uh, but this was done by, by a company, a monopoly instead, that had bought out all the other companies and to make one monopoly. And, uh, you know, the, the effects on, on the country um, over this period were, were deeply profound because it changed the United States from a country that had primarily been a nation of small business, small farmers, um, storefronts, general stores, uh, maybe some sort of larger department stores, into one that is much more actually like we know today, you know, dominated by, by large corporations. Um, instead of owners or managers, um, people became employees of, of a much larger concern with its headquarters somewhere far away. So all of this was a, a fundamental challenge, I'd say, to the hierarchy, to the structure, uh, to the social life of the United States. Uh, not to mention uh, the premises of, of equality uh, that had long undergirded the idea of the American uh, Republic. Well, let's talk about equality, in particular, income or wealth equality. This was also the rise of the ultra millionaire, the very wealthy people who heretofore had never even been imagined in their scale, scope and power. How did wealth change in America during the, the Gilded Age? Well, yeah, that's uh, an important change, maybe one of the most important for our purposes, thinking about our times. Uh, Alex de Tocqueville had, had famously come to America in the 1830s, and the opening line of Democracy in America, and I'm translating from French, there's different translations, but roughly he said, that the most striking thing about America is the equality of conditions everywhere. And by that, I think he meant that, um, you know, it was a, a nation where you could, you could arrive, um, you know, set up your own farm or start your own dry goods business. And um, you were all sort of in it together, uh, particularly on the frontier. People were uh, facing nature uh, and uh, the challenges of just survival and, you know, had to kind of work together to do it and, and really weren't uh, greatly different in their wealth and income. I mean, there was always Eastern people with, with more money, established families down South. But um, uh, generally, that was the idea of the American Republic. Uh, the monopolization of the American economy dramatically transformed uh, that equation. And it did so in, in several ways. So one of the main techniques for monopolizing the economy was to combine all of the companies in one industry into a single company. Uh, so for example, U.S. Steel, which was created by J.P. Morgan, 
uh, was a buyout of hundreds of steel companies, uh, including Carnegie Steel Company, all into a, a single unit called U.S. Steel. Uh, there was a single tobacco company made of all of the tobacco companies, a single match company, a single film company, a single, you, you name it, there was one company. And these combinations, uh, trusts was the, the word, they uh, tended to be public companies through monopoly, were able to uh, eliminate competition and improve their livelihood, and therefore produce fantastic gains for the, the owner of the stocks, the owners of the companies who had, who had sold out, and uh, some of the investors. Uh, so that was a big transformation. Uh, U.S. Steel itself, the proceeds from that sale, uh, transformed the town of Pittsburgh with all the money coming in from steel uh, stock and the ability of build, to build mansions. And so even, even today, you know, we talk about an IPO enriching people. Uh, th these were uh, even greater, at least in relative magnitude, because they created the wealth differential that was so large. And the other big change is with these concentrated economies, with these big companies, uh, they had and used uh, scale uh, and used employees at a level of scale never been seen before. So you have the, the, the beginnings of what we now recognize as the working class, that is huge armies of um, nominally free labor, but people who are working for a, a very large company under, under difficult conditions for low wages. And that too was something new in, a, as I said, a nation that had uh, thought of itself as, as more of an agricultural country. So the disparity in wealth that has become almost the trademark of the United States in the last 20 years or so has its birthplace, has its origins in the Gilded Age. And as I think you can see, many of the, the causes of it are very similar. You mentioned both uh, J.P. Morgan and uh, Andrew Carnegie. These titans of industry were, were all self-made men. They didn't have wealthy backgrounds. They knew what it was like to be an average American because they were. But they created enormous fortunes, often by exploiting uh, other business owners and their workers. What is the ideology behind men like this who can see that not only their own fortunes improving, but the fortunes of their, what were their, you know, their neighbors and townspeople changing so drastically? The, the people to focus on in that regard are, are really John Rockefeller and, and Andrew Carnegie. You know, they were, as you said, uh, people who came from, from humble backgrounds and uh, built up these empires one way or another. Rockefeller obviously built up Standard Oil in the 1870s, um, the, the largest company in the world uh, until U.S. Steel. And uh, he was, at the time, Rockefeller, so wealthy as a percentage of GNP that no one has equaled him since. You know, we talk about how rich uh, Jeff Bezos might be or, or Bill Gates or similar figures, but there, there was no comparison in terms of their share of the national economy. Um, you know, you have to sort of compare them to some of the old pharaohs or something. <laughs> so, you know, how were they able to sort of sustain this idea? Well, much of this was reflected in the popularity of social Darwinism, a, a philosophy, uh, for some a religion, popularized by a man named Herbert Spencer, who was an English philosopher uh, who borrowed heavily from the ideas of, of Charles Darwin. And the idea was roughly that uh, humanity was in the course of an evolutionary process where those who were more fit, those who were more capable, uh, were in the process of rising above their peers, uh, of becoming a new man towards a different kind of society, towards a different economy. Um, for some people, like Andrew Carnegie, uh, it began to function almost like a, a religion, you know, that uh, the Christianity had been too much about humility and, and uh, you know, um, the meek shall inherit the earth and uh, that sort of thing. No, th this was a different kind of vision. This was human perfectibility. And so then by this logic, um, you can see why it would appeal to the uh, then uh, millionaire, billionaire class. It suggested that chosen ones were those who had uh, proven it. <laughs> The men, uh, usually men, uh, I guess some women who were putting together these giant fortunes, who were destroying other companies, they had won the fight. And a company like Standard Oil was clearly uh, the victor, was clearly the fittest that had beaten out all of its other competitors. So you can see that uh, evolutionary theory bled quite easily uh, into this sort of uh, idea of industrial competition producing winners and losers. Winner corporations, the winner companies like Standard Oil, uh, like U.S. Steel, 
they were deserved of their exalted status, deserved all of this money, because they had uh, won in the struggle uh, of survival and they had killed or destroyed their sort of um, lesser competitors or, or bought them out or, or, or done whatever. And I think that this philosophy, this way of thinking about things, did a, did a lot to make it comfortable for, for these men uh, to do what they did. There is in this period, you begin to see the birth of a, a kind of a dual morality, a set of principles for one's private life that are different than one what does in, in public life. Uh, J.P. Morgan was a, a devout Christian. Um, so was uh, John Rockefeller. Um, they gave conspicuously to charity. Uh, J.P. Morgan was a, a major figure in his church. But, you know, when they were on business, somehow it all changed. Uh, they, they, they had a completely different outlook. Um, it wasn't about, you know, helping the poor or, or they, they just took advantage of anything they could. They competed roughly, even brutally. Uh, J.P. Morgan, um, even though it was a church-going figure in his private life with a, with a family, uh, he would get aboard his yacht and um, have a succession of uh, female visitors and um, a kind of a debaucherous lifestyle. So they had this kind of divide in their lives that I think we still see today sometimes. Uh, I still think there's a lot of people uh, who, you know, would consider themselves um, sort of moral, uh, careful people in uh, some aspects of life. But then when it comes to business, uh, well, that's different. You know, that you have to kind of set aside your, your thinking about what's right and wrong and, and get to the business of winning. And that's the way we do things. And I think this era is really where you start to see the birth of that divide in how businessmen approach morality. Not all businessmen, I should say, but uh, that that becomes normalized, I guess. So uh, in my thinking just now about social Darwinism and monopolies, it occurs to me that a Darwinism, even in business, would entail that the best idea wins, the best process, the most efficient. And monopolies certainly achieve their, their scale through the ruthless pursuit of efficiency. But once they get big enough to squash competitors, the ascendance of new ideas, the, the lack of competition, threatens to stagnate the industry because the little guy with the great idea can't achieve much. It requires, at least in some level, an even playing field to allow the ideas to germinate. This seems to be a metaphor also for those persons who come to America with nothing, looking for exactly that even playing field. And this is the immigrant population, which exploded during the, the Gilded Age. What was their reception in American society? Uh, how did how did government react, and how is this a gilded age phenomenon? Yeah, you, you know, you you have put your finger on the heart of the monopoly paradox, which is to say, these were men who ideologically said they were committed to competition, to the survival of the fittest, to you know let everyone have their go, but the the methods they use uh, to stay in power the buying out of firms, predatory pricing, bribing government officials, enacting tariffs when necessary, putting restrictions on immigrants, all were designed to make competition entirely unfair and, in fact, to continue and their incumbency and ensure that they would never be displaced from power. So uh, it was a competition for everyone except for us because we have won. And uh, yeah, it wasn't ever clear. There's always been, and still is today, this great tension between a belief in competition unfettered and uh, the sense that uh, leads to monopoly and totally unfettered uh, monopolies can, in fact, destroy competition. Well, they, they didn't really work too hard to figure out the answers to that question. And I think you were right. I think any advantage there was to try to, to prevent immigrants from becoming serious uh, threats uh, any opportunity was taken to restrict that. Um, I was thinking about the Chinese labor uh, as a good example. Uh, as you probably know, there were uh, the first immigration laws in this period placed um, serious restrictions on Chinese immigration. But beyond that, people may know this less, there were um, simply bans on the kind of work that Chinese immigrants were allowed to do. You know, they were restricted from uh, certain forms of business, maybe from the fear they might be too tough competition. Uh, which is why if you watch an old movie, you'll see the Chinese people running the laundry mats. That's because that's where uh, they were restricted to. So yes, a great uh, contradiction in the center of it and one that ends to look more like a self-perpetuating ideology rather than, than uh, something uh, truly committed to some rise of excellence.
American History Tellers is sponsored by Sleep Number. Every morning, my wife and I ask each other, how'd you sleep? Why? Because for us working middle-aged parents, a good night's sleep is important. A bad night will certainly make for a bad day. Our cognitive and immune health depend on good sleep, which is why staying active during the day, putting your phone down before bed, and getting comfortable at night is important. But there's even more you can do. Sleep Number's Sleep IQ tracks how well you sleep and offers insight into your sleep. It measures your best sleep hours, heart rate, breathing, and movement. Connect these data to your favorite health and wellness apps and gain even more insight. All from a bed that allows you to adjust on each side to the ideal firmness, comfort, and support for both you and your partner. The Sleep Number 360 smart bed senses your movements and automatically adjusts to keep you sleeping comfortably throughout the night. Come in during the biggest sale of the year when all beds are on sale. For a limited time, save 50% on a Sleep Number 360 limited edition smart bed. Shop your way at a Sleep Number store, online at sleepnumber.com slash tellers, or by chat. I think the scope of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which is probably what we're talking about here, is enormous and quite appalling to modern Americans. It, for decades, prohibited Chinese uh, immigration and, as you mentioned, uh, limits their participation in American society quite a bit. What were the lasting impacts of this act? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think that um, to this day has, I think, left the uh, Asian American population, if I can talk about now, somewhat with a sense that, um, you know, from the beginning, there are certain jobs that they are more welcome to do and certain that they're less welcome to do such as running things, as opposed to, you know, being the back office and uh, making things work. So that's my, you know, my own own opinion. Um, but I feel like I've seen that with, with some of my, my peers. And uh, obviously, um, you know, speaking on uh, racial history, less my, my theory, that, you know, just the sheer act of a ban on immigration resulted in there being less Chinese people uh, in the West. So um, those are the, I think, the most uh, the most obvious impacts of that uh, of that law. Your book spells out dangers that come with income inequality, uh, and those dangers include populism. Uh, we saw in our series the rise of a of populist party, but what are some parallels in how disparities in wealth today have sparked the same sentiments in in the present moment? Yes, I am strongly of the belief that behind every um, period of exceptionally angry politics. Uh, lies a, a failure to uh, distribute economic proceeds in a fair way and uh, give the middle class uh, a sense that they're being treated in a reasonable fashion. Um, that's uh, certainly the case of the turn of the 19th to 20th century, which we're talking about, uh, very strongly the case in the 1930s, during which we saw the rise of fascism uh, around the world. And I think, and very much a, a, a feature of our times, I think that we uh, are in a danger, a period where the politics of the late 19th century and the 30s have replicated themselves, where uh, ordinary sort of working people, middle class, uh, feel that the deck is, is stacked against them and feel that they have no chance, I, I suppose, um, in an economy uh, that is dominated by concentrated interests. Now, people take that in different directions. You know, they know they're angry. Some people blame corporations. Other people, uh, as in other times, turn to blame immigrants, foreigners, uh, the Chinese, uh, Jewish uh, conspiracies. Uh, you know, anger goes in a lot of different directions, but it turns us into a radical kind of politics. I think it creates the potential, as it did in the 30s, for the rise of very dangerous figures. Uh, if I can return to the Gilded Age, uh, I also think there is a in some ways, a solution, and uh, or some, it's it's helpful to look at how other countries dealt with it uh, without uh, having a full out revolution. Uh, if we turn back to the the nineteen, the early twentieth century, I give a lot of credit in my book uh, to Theodore Roosevelt, who was not always exactly seen as a hero of the working classes, but he did uh, recognize this important fact. He felt very profoundly that there was a tension between the rise of monopoly corporations with so much private power and the premise of democracy, which was that the people rule the country and that at some point in the end, they get to say what happens. Because by that point, um, you know, men like J.P. Morgan 
Rockefeller, I, I truly think they believe themselves sovereign over government, uh, that they uh, were the ones running the economy, that they decided what was going to happen, and in fact, that they knew best. And Roosevelt, when he took the sort of startling maneuvers of blocking a major merger by J.P. Morgan of, of two railroad companies, and then breaking Standard Oil into uh, 35 pieces, that uh, he was using the antitrust laws as an instrument of democratic will. He was saying that at some point, here the people rule. And uh, I think he deserves enormous credit for that, especially in the sense that he used this law that, you know, he didn't confiscate. It wasn't like the Soviet Union, where they just sort of nationalized their corporations. Uh, It wasn't like in fascist Germany, actually, that's the most dangerous direction, where Uh, the corporations became sort of the instruments of the leader's will. Instead, he reduced their power. And it's a profound move and uh, one that I think he uh, uh, does deserve more credit for. Well, let's talk about Roosevelt and the progressive movement. There seems to be a a sea change in American governance and politicians' view of these corporations and the concentration of wealth and power. From this comes some legislation at the end of the the 19th century, and then certainly its implementation in uh, in the early 20th century. Where did that antitrust argument come from? That's a good question. You know, like almost all things in America, every uh, revolution is described as a counter-revolution. And the people who were behind the antitrust movement, figures like Louis Brandeis, to some degree Theodore Roosevelt, and uh, the, an earlier generation of activists who, who fought against uh, Standard Oil. These people all harken back to uh, the way America used to be. And the idea that the founding ideas of the Republic were that uh, any concentration of power had to be viewed as suspect. And that this was meant to be not only a political democracy, but also an economic democracy. So those were the ideas they, they drew upon. They also, as is very common in American history, drew upon uh, English sources, English traditions. And uh, it had been a a tradition in England since the time of Queen Elizabeth, uh, or it had been the law that monopolies were illegal. It was a little vague what that meant. Uh, They usually meant state monopolies. But uh, you had had the Tea Party in the United States, uh, uh, the original Tea Party, uh, as an anti-monopoly protest. And uh, so there was this idea of both combining what America was supposed to be and English sources of law and English traditions uh, inherited by Americans to create this, uh, actually a truly American invention, the antitrust laws, the idea that there should be some outer limit on private power, that the economy should not be run by monopolies. And in the progressive era, um, you know, this was a heated, heated uh, movement. This was something people believe passionately about. You have figures like Ida Tarbell, who wrote a a multi-part series on the Standard Oil Company, revealed it for what she uh, said it was, which was an abusive, immoral uh, colossus that had uh, sort of taken something from the American people. And, um, you know, it was so uh, intense, so uh, driven that the 1912 election, when you go back and read the debates, uh, you know, they read like an antitrust uh, academic conference. uh, the, the, the discussion is about economic structure. And actually, at some level, I think we are somewhat having that conversation today. When people talk about big tech, uh, when candidates say that I want to break up uh, Facebook or you know, reduce the power of Amazon, in some ways, uh, it is back to that uh, conversation. And frankly, I don't think you could be having a more important conversation. At least to me, it's better than the prospect of, a, of an actual a revolution, anarchist, socialist, or fascist, which is sort of the other alternative. Speaking of big tech, last month there were congressional hearings regarding whether tech giants have too much power. So in thinking about the monopolies of the Gilded Age, what worries do you have about any parallels from that time and what's going on now with uh, the immense power of Facebook, Amazon, Apple, and Google? I think there are parallels. Um, As in the Gilded Age, there's a a sort of new generation of companies uh, claiming a different way of doing business. Um, It's sort of imbued with a sense that they are somehow profoundly different, and in some ways they are. Uh, And they have the same form, the monopoly form, that was popular 
And they, and also, and especially companies like Facebook and Amazon, uh, have gained their position by mergers, by buying out um, anyone who might be threatening to them. Uh, I should add Google to that as, as well. So there are great similarities. And similarly, uh, you know, it, much of the public in the Gilded Age was in awe of the companies like U.S. Steel or Standard Oil, amazed by their scientific uh, progress and so forth. So I think there's a lot of similarities, but I think ultimately to recapture our freedom, to have this be a democracy, we, we need a reckoning. We are having a reckoning where the companies accept that they are ruled by the people at some level and that, you know, despite the technology, whatever advances they have, that uh, there are interests in human thriving uh, that at some point they will have to respect or um, find themselves facing the ultimate uh, power in this country, which is uh, the sovereign. American History Tellers is sponsored by American Giant. I firmly believe right now is the best time ever to be alive. Maybe not 2020 specifically, but in general, we're healthier, wealthier, and living longer than any time before us. That's not to say, though, that we haven't strayed from some of the better aspects of our past. A lot has been said about American manufacturing, for instance, and nowhere has its decline been felt more than in textiles, which is what makes American Giant different. American Giant has built a 100% USA-based supply chain. It's not the cheapest, but it makes for a better sweatshirt, and it's better for our people and our planet. These are the reasons to buy American Giant, who is reclaiming the American tradition of making high-quality clothes that last. You'll wear them more, so ultimately, you'll need less. And if you've ever picked up a piece of clothing and felt the heft, noticed the flawless seams and fastidious finish, appreciated zippers and closures of quality, you'll know how much I like my American Giant sweatshirt. It's a staple now, and probably an heirloom later. Get 15% off your first order when you use promo code AHT at American-Giant.com. That's 15% off when you use code AHT at American-Giant.com. I'm interested in the implementation of antitrust law. Although Standard Oil was broken up, Rockefeller still owned most of it and continued to reap benefits. Do these antitrust laws work? Especially uh, now, in, in a moment in which uh, the last two decades saw uh, several industries that are just too big to fail. It's a, been a persistent question, you know, do these laws work uh, since their beginnings? And it is a, it is a hard uh, question. I think that um, uh, you need to compare it to the alternatives. Um, the main thing that America did with its laws was it broke up most of the monopolies. It banned mergers to monopolies, so you weren't allowed to put everyone together, and it banned price-fixing cartels. Uh, in countries like Germany and Japan, um, early 20th century, they didn't take that approach. They, in fact, uh, encouraged and um, saw the monopoly companies as, um, as kind of helping the national cause. And I think, um, I won't say that caused uh, what was to follow, but I do think when it came time, uh, for example, for Hitler to redirect the economy towards the war effort, for him, it was only a matter of needing to convert a few people, convince them of the merits of his cause. And he already had a command economy built for him. Uh, in Japan, the crossover between public and private spheres was um, uh, complete. There was no, almost no uh, line between private industry and government. And I think to the extent that antitrust has prevented the worst abuses, that it uh, has merit. And uh, it could always be better. It's difficult to prevent uh, enforcement. I think it should do more to prevent corruption. But some core prohibitions are very important in my mind for preventing a total transformation of the economy and a total shift of power uh, to such a small number of people. And what do you think those core prohibitions are? Well, you know, how much time do you have? It's a, a subject of a, a full semester at uh, Columbia. But the um, core, as I said, I think you have to uh, prevent an industry from becoming monopolized or duopolized or even triopolized. I think major industries should be kept at you know, four players, for example. And despite whatever excuses, despite whatever, oh, it's going to be better and so forth, natural monopoly is always better. That, that uh, is better kept at bay. 
just too much power in, in one in one person. And I think the most uh, anti-competitive mergers, the buying of your competitors or the uh, merging of a whole industry, as Morgan did, into a monopoly is also exceptionally a dangerous phenomenon. Those are, are uh, you know, kind of at the core. Pri- price fixing is, is another one it's, uh, that you widely banned. You know, if we could just keep that going, <laughs> just um, prevent those things, prevent uh, the killing of, of smaller competitors, I think that pushed some limit on, on private power. Now, a skeptic would say, you know, that that's not really enough. And in some ways, I'd agree. I uh, also believe in things like minimum wage laws and protection, uh, other protections from the outskirts of, of capitalism. But what really has to happen, what sometimes people don't think fully enough about, is the importance of a limit on power, a structural limit on power which is very different than saying, okay, you can run this industry, but we want you to uh, obey health and safety laws, something like that. No, this gets to the core of who rules, who has power. And that lies at the core of the anti-monopoly prohibition. I think perhaps second only to our First Amendment rights. There's nothing more innately American that Americans feel about themselves anyway than the, the purpose and divinity even of the free market. Capitalism is something that this country was built on. It's something that this country uh, pursues. A quick survey of other leading countries shows that we have, are more unfettered than others. So there is this tension between a unique American faith in capitalism and antitrust or any sort of legislative limits on it. I'm reading right now some research on the history of business consulting, a field that is perhaps reviled now, but started in the mid-century, mid-20th century with ideas and insights that uh, indicate, for instance, any mature industry would only have at maximum four players. And yet you've just indicated that there should be a minimum of four players. Um, This this tension of what works in business, what Americans think capitalism is, and then (laughs) what they desire protection from, how is it reconciled? Well, we're still figuring that out, aren't we? You know, it is, uh, I think a lot of Americans believe the the golden goose, but I I like to look at the alternatives and maybe that's uh, unfair, but, you know, the traditional alternatives to trying to limit the power through structure, which is the idea of antitrust, are nationalization, uh, which is, you know, usually not always uh, part of a uh, socialist economy, a planned economy, relatedly. Um, sort of Mussolini approach. Uh, On the other side, an entirely unfettered capitalism, which has the results of such severe inequality that it leads, once again, to the pressures for for a popular uprising. So, you know, I I don't know if I will defend antitrust laws to the death, but I do think it is an effort to deal with the excesses of capitalism within its own terms, or make a free market system actually a free market system. Because a free market system, despite everything it's said about it, uh, always bites its own tail, always has the capacity to become uh, and take over and isolate itself from, in fact, the free market and instead turn into something uh, which is very different from that. Uh, just in, for example, the, the control of government. Any corporation past certain size uh, will realize that to stay in power and maximize its profit, the thing to do is to control government. Um, look at the pharmaceutical industry, it's a perfect example. And you can say, oh, that, that sounds alarmist. I, I don't think it's alarmist. I think it's a natural calculation. But once you have that union of government and industry, you no longer have anything like a free market system. So the free market system, uh, you know, the, the, some of the uh, anti-fascist Germans in the 30s had this saying, which is that uh, freedom must be defended to stay free. <laughs> And that the free market uh, left to itself will always turn on itself. So that's the tradition I believe in. And that's what I think we need in our times. Uh, if we do want to preserve this engine of, of growth, which I think works for people and avoid its excesses. Timothy Wu, thank you for speaking with me today. Been a pleasure. That was my conversation with Tim Wu. Wu is a Columbia law professor and author of The Curse of Bigness, Antitrust in the New Gilded Age. Next on American History Tellers, an encore presentation of our series on the history of political parties in the United States. It hasn't always been the Democrats and Republicans. 
in the run-up to our next election in November of 2020. Learn how what started as unanimous enthusiasm for George Washington led nearly immediately to a struggle for power between political parties led by idealists, partisans, statesmen, and schemers. From Wondery, this is Episode 7 of The Gilded Age for American History Tellers. If you like our show, please give us a five-star rating and leave a review, and be sure to tell your friends. I also have two other podcasts you might like, American Scandal and American Elections Wicked Game. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, the Wondery app, or wherever you're listening right now. Join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app to listen ad-free. You'll also find some links and offers from our sponsors in the episode notes. Supporting them helps us keep offering our shows for free. Another way you can support the show is by filling out a small survey at wondery.com survey. You can also find us and me on Twitter and Facebook. Follow the show at A.H. Tellers, and I'm at Lindsay A. Graham. American History Tellers is hosted, edited, and produced by me, Lindsey Graham, for Airship. This episode was produced by Andre No. Our executive producers are Jenny Lara Beckman and Marshall Louie, created by Hernan Lopez for Wondering.